In the video today, we're answering a viewer question because Alex B asks us, when did people start yelling for in golf? It is generally agreed that for is shorthand for the word before or afore, which was an old Scottish saying essentially meaning look out ahead. As to how it became associated with golf, in 1824, the rules of the Thistle Golf Club recounts a conversation where it was expressed that one of the speakers had performed the duty of poor caddy for the Duke of York back in 1681. Specifically, Dixon was then performing the duty of what is now commonly called a four caddy. The job of the four caddy still exists today. Their role is to locate and determine the placement of the ball to ensure there is no cheating. They are usually employed during tournament play when the stakes are at the highest. These caddies used to be employed more frequently in the 18th century for fear the golf ball, a more expensive item back then, would be lost. Thus, it's generally thought that the practice got its start from golfers yelling four at the four caddies to let them know the ball was coming and to get ready to be on the lookout. Another hypothesis stems from military usage, where soldiers at higher points would yell at those on the front line below for as a warning to duck from oncoming musket shots. While this really was a term used in battle, there is disagreement which came first, the military using a golf term or golfers using a military term. Either way, for is just an antiquated Scottish way of saying look out ahead. Moving on to another golf topic, ever wonder why there are specifically 18 holes in golf? I want to know more. The Royal and Ancient Golf Club of St Andrew in Scotland was founded in 1754, and it was, as it remains to this day, one of the most prestigious golf clubs in the world. Golfers had been playing on this particular parcel of land as early as the 15th century on a course dictated by the topography. In other words, they placed holes all the way to where they could play no more, where land meets water at the St Andrews Bay. The course that emerged was 11 holes, so when they finished the first time through, they would turn around again and play 11 again, making it a total of 22 holes. This brings us to October 4, 1764, and a letter written by four-time captain of the St Andrews Golf Course, William St Clair of Rosslyn. St Andrews, 4th of October 1754. The captain and gentlemen golfers present are of opinion that it would be for the improvement of the links that the first four holes should be converted into two. They therefore have agreed that for the future they shall be played as two holes in the same way as presently marked out. W.M. St Clair. Thus, St. Clair and others in charge of the course determined that there were four holes that were too short, probably originally done this way to fit the holes onto the land. So they combined them into two holes, making each round now nine holes instead of eleven, and bringing the total to eighteen holes for a game. As St. Andrews grew in influence, other self-respecting golf courses made the change to eighteen holes. It was an unofficial regulation for the next two centuries or so, until the 1950s, when it became a stipulated regulation that a course had to be eighteen holes for tournament play. Moving on to another golfing term's origins, bogey. It seems that the term comes from a song from the 1890s popular in the British Isles entitled The Bogeyman. Yes, this is a reference to the horror movie staple The Bogeyman. The character in the song is described as elusive with the lyrics, I'm the bogeyman, catch me if you can. Since golfers were always in pursuit of the elusive perfect score, they began to refer to the amount of strokes that should be expected on a particular hole as a bogey, as in playing against the bogeyman to try and match his score. We now know this to be par, and a bogey is one stroke over par. In fact, an early golfing rules book has a section dedicated to the rules of bogey competitions, or otherwise known as stroke play tournaments. An article from 1908 cited by the OED first in 1933 explains the supposed exact origin, though the accuracy of this is impossible to discern. One popular song at least has left its permanent effect on the game of golf. That song is The Bogeyman. In 1890, Dr. Thos Brown, R.N., the Honorable Secretary of the Great Yarmouth Club, was playing against a major wellman, the match being against the ground score, which was the name given to the scratch value of each hole. The system of playing against the ground score was next to Major Wellman, and he exclaimed, thinking of the song of the moments, that his mysterious and well-nigh invincible opponent was a regular bogeyman. The name caught on at Great Yarmouth, and today bogey is one of the most feared opponents on all the courses that acknowledge him. 
Bogey became known as one over an ideal score around the 20th century due to tightening of perfect scores on course. The ubiquity of the usage made sure that the term didn't go away, now becoming a reference to a near perfect score. Moving on to mulligan, as most know, the term mulligan extends much further beyond just golf and sports. It has come to be used in politics and daily life with the word meaning do over. Of course, taking a mulligan is not allowed in regulated or tournament golf, but many amateur golfers have utilized this unofficial rule to their advantage. This well-used term is actually named after a real person, though there is some dispute as to which of the two men should be credited. In the late 1920s and into the 1930s, a Canadian amateur golfer named David Bernard Mulligan was making a name for himself in more prominent golfing clubs of New York. He was so popular that he had a regular foursome that he would pick up and drive to the course in his classy 1920s Briscoe. As the tale is told, one day after driving to the course, Mulligan took his first shot and shanked it. Said Mulligan in 1985 during an interview. I was so provoked with myself that on impulse I stooped over and put down another ball. The other three looked at me with considerable puzzlement, and one of them asked, What are you doing? I'm taking a correction shot, I replied. Then Mulligan's playing partner asked what he called that. Thinking fast, I told him that I called it a mulligan. They laughed and let me play a second ball. Mulligan further explained from then on, if you were not satisfied with your first shot off the first tee, you could take a mulligan. Another story about how this became a mulligan comes from a golf club locker room attendant in Essex Falls, New Jersey, named John Buddy Mulligan. The story associated with him was that one day he finished his chorus early and convinced two club members to play with him. When he botched his opening shot, he insisted that they had been practicing all morning and he deserved another shot because he had just started playing. So he got another shot. Upon hearing this story, the other members of the club started doing this and calling it a mulligan as an inside joke. No matter what story is true, historians generally go with David Mulligan, or if the details are perfectly accurate, the term mulligan seems to have come from the insistence of one individual with that name that they should be allowed a do-over. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. Brand new videos just like this every day of the week. For more from me, why not check out another channel I do called Biographics, Biographies of Notable People from History in the Present Day. That is linked to below. And as always, thank you for watching.